Um, so I'm excited to be here today and present uh, one of our projects. I hope you hear. I hope you enjoy hearing a little bit about our work. Um, but I want to start by uh, defining why we use the term sensible city um, in lieu of smart cities, which is what everyone uses. And we find that the word smart city focuses a little too much on the technologies themselves and not enough on the people and the citizens who actually live in the cities. Our lab was founded in 2005 uh, as a joint venture between the MIT Media Lab as well as the, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And, and what we really do is uh, we strive to better understand human behavior in our cities. And we do this by leveraging advancements in sensor-based technologies as well as data analytics capabilities and data visualization techniques. Given this broad nature of our research, uh, researchers come to our lab from many different backgrounds. Uh, we have people from design and architecture like myself, um, as well as engineering, computer science, physics, math, as well as people from the social sciences. But everyone is really interested in the same question, and that is how the ubiquity of digital devices and network infrastructures are impacting our cities and urban living. So I'm gonna start by going back in time a little to the early 1990s. At that time, scholars speculated about the impact of the ongoing digital revolution on the viability of cities. We saw images like this. And the mainstream view was that because digital media and internet killed distance, they would also kill cities. George Gilder famously proclaimed that Cities are leftover baggage from the industrial era and concluded that we are headed for the death of cities due to the continued growth of personal computing, telecommunications, and distributed production. As we entered this new paradigm, many predictions about the future were made. But in fact, cities have never prospered so much as they have over the past couple of decades. China poured more concrete into buildings, roads, and highways in the three most recent years than the United States did over the course of the entire 20th century. And a historic moment occurred in 2008. For the first time in history, more than half of the world's population was living in urban areas. And we all know that this number is, is just growing. So the digital revolution didn't end up killing our cities, but, but neither did it leave them unaffected. Digital technologies have turned our cities into hubs of data creation. So to give you an example of how much data we're creating today, this is five billion gigabytes. And this is the amount of data that was generated since the dawn of humanity to 2003. So every single book written, the Bible, Shakespeare, every newspaper article is all within this five billion gigabytes. And today we're producing the same amount of data in only 24 hours. And this number, this time frame is just getting smaller and smaller. It's getting smaller because we're no longer just producing data from people talking to each other, but objects are now talking to one another. We hit a milestone in 2010 with 5 billion connected devices, and projections from Ericsson indicate an exponential growth that we're set to hit 50 billion connected devices by, um, by 2020. And we heard this number earlier this morning as well. And this is happening as your phone talks to your wrist and to your husband's wrist and to your car and to your home. And as this is happening, our cities are becoming like computers in open air. We're embedding this new functional layer over our cities with which uh, a digital nervous system with which we interact on a daily basis. So before I jump into Underworlds, I want to highlight our work with an early project that we did which was set to, to visualize interactions in the digital realm back in 2006. So this was the first time that cell phone data, telecommunication data was used spatially to illustrate urban patterns. And as you may or may not remember, 2006 was a World Cup year and the final was between Italy and France and France, um, Zaydan gave that infamous headbutt. So we decided to build a heat map of Rome um, and looking at cell phone data to do this during the game. So with this, we're able to give the public really a glimpse into the living pulse of their city. So you can see people wake up around 10 a.m., they start making calls, the, the red concentration is kind of cell phone activity in the city. 
The game starts at 8 p.m. and the city goes quiet. So everyone's watching the game, France scores, Italy scores, half time, everyone makes a quick call. The second half begins, end of normal time, it's one to one, really tense right now. Zidane gets the red card, Italy scores, and the World Cup ends and the city just goes wild. So everyone kind of gathers in the northern part of the city where they're all partying, they party late into the night, um, continue the next morning where, when the team comes down to meet all the fans. So this was the first time that telecom data using uh, anonymous aggregated cell phone activity was used to understand mobility and human dynamics at the scale of the city. And this is just one example of this story that we can tell. So our work with telecom data, um, as well as projects that we've done with transit and, uh, and um, bank data, financial transaction data, is all insightful and it really tells us a lot about human behavior. But this is with information that's already being generated and stored. What about other information that's currently untapped? Data sets that aren't being automatically created. As computing power is getting smaller and smaller, we're provided with an opportunity to weave networked sensor infrastructures into our urban environment. Underworlds is attempting to weave this into the sewage. So with this project, we're building a platform to mine human waste for biochemical data. It's one of the largest projects that our lab has ever taken on, and it's involving multiple departments at MIT. We're leading it at Sensible, but we're working with labs in microbiology, biochemical engineering, as well as computer science, artificial intelligence, and civil and environmental engineering. And the premise behind the project is that there's a massive amount of data stored in an individual's microbiome. So that's data on eating habits, genetic tendencies, disease, and overall health. You can tell a lot about a person by sampling their gut. And as this data is flushed down the toilet, there's a vast reservoir of information on human health and behavior that goes with it. Um, and this lives on in our sewage. And this resource, what we like to call it, is untapped. So Underworlds proposes to develop a human health census by sampling the urban gut, or the, or the city's sewage. And when we think about this type of sampling, we often look to wastewater treatment plants. That's where it's traditionally done. Um, but these plants are often many miles away from the communities they serve, and they collect much runoff along the way, diluting the, the biochemical signal. What's innovative about this project is that we're sampling throughout the sewage network in the city to develop individual readings of particular neighborhoods, as well as the aggregate reading of the city. In this way, we're hoping to create a real-time or close to real-time platform, um, close to the source, so that we can accurately represent a defined community. And this idea of mapping disease isn't new. It was first attempted by John Snow um, in a very analog way with his, uh, with his um, sorry, map uh, of the cholera outbreak in London in 1854. Correlating water quality to um, instances of the disease Snow was able to trace the source of the outbreak to a single public water pump. And through this, he gave birth to the science of modern epidemiology and also transformed the city with the advent of wastewater management. So today, we're able to really bring what Snow attempted into the 21st century. In order to achieve this, we needed to answer some very important questions. We need to determine what it is we're looking for um, so pathogens of interest, and we're doing this together with stakeholders such as the Department of Public Health and Public Works, and figuring out where in the city is best to sample, how close or far from the source before we begin to compromise the signal, and also at what time of day, as well as how exactly to collect the samples. What is the best sampling method? Do we want a grab sample or, or is a representative sample taken over time? To answer these questions, we designed a multi-step project where we begin to characterize the sewage network, collect and process samples, prep them for biological analysis, and then pair this data with um, demographic data to build a front-end visualization and platform to interpret these findings so they, they can be, um, begin to inform public policy, health practitioners, designers, urban researchers, and citizens. Working together with labs in bioengineering, we're designing experiments to look for viruses for the tracking of disease. Um, currently, disease monitoring is symptomatic, 
So when people get sick and if they choose to go to the hospital, um, hospitals are plotting where, where these um, are emerging from. Um, with this platform, we can begin to track disease during the incubation period, so before people become sick. We're looking at bacteria, so we can begin to quantify a population's antibiotic resistance, as well as chemical compounds to measure non-communicable diseases, such as obesity and diabetes. We can begin to measure the downstream effects of public health policy. So for example, when former New York Mayor Bloomberg put a ban on uh, the size of soft drinks that could be sold in Manhattan, do we see a change in the urban microbiome three, four, six months down the line? And then also we can begin to monitor the use of pharmaceutical and illicit drugs. We're currently piloting the project in Cambridge in Massachusetts, um, but we also need to figure out where in the city to collect the sample. Um, so with GIS information, we've, we've built a workflow that allows us to select individual manholes based on the characteristics of their respective catchment areas. So for our preliminary studies, we're not interested in sampling neighborhoods um, less than, that serve a population of less than 4,000 people, and we want them to be about 90% residential. Next, uh, to determine the optimal sampling time, we conducted a 24-hour study where we took one um, sample every hour over 24 hours. We wanted to avoid times when there were a lot of soaps and detergents in the water um, to compromise the signal. So basically, we wanted to find the strongest bacterial and viral um, signal possible. And we found that we had a considerably lower concentration in bacteria overnight, um, as well as the flow rate was a lot lower. And we started to see a spike around 12, 1 p.m. We manually conducted these experiments. Um, that's me on the right, and it was not the most pleasant. Um, in order to get a representative signal, we need to process about a liter of sewage. So that was 24 liters that we were lugging back to the lab. Um, and so we decided that we needed to figure out how, that, how we were gonna take these samples and how best to automize this process. And that was very important for us. So we began exploring this question and trying to find ways of onboarding the pre-processing. This is a photograph of our first prototype, which we tested about a month ago now um, for the first time. And this prototype allows us to pass any given amount of raw sewage through a viral and bacterial filter, concentrating the pathogens in situ while discarding the rest. Um, this allowed us to really begin to experiment with multiple sample sizes while only taking a small filter back to the lab for DNA extraction. Uh, the prototype was also designed with multiple compartments, um, able to hold up to six samples without cross-contamination. Um, the robot was controlled remotely via an iPhone app that allowed you to program the sampling time of each compartment. This is just a short clip um, of our first deployment. And it begins to give you a, a glimpse into the almost ancient sewers of Cambridge. It's So this prototype, um, aptly named Mario, as he traveled up and down sewers, wasn't the most efficient. Um, highly customized components required a lot of assembly, uh, fabrication was really slow, and with many moving parts, deployment was difficult, uh, and as such, the margin for error was great. There was also a laborious disinfection process that had to happen. So introducing Luigi, Mario's faster, slimmer cousin. <laughs> So Luigi is our newest prototype, built with off-the-shelf components, allowing for rapid prototyping and fabrication. He's very easy to deploy and extremely lightweight. Um, the sterilization process was built into the design, so it's quite easy for operators to use. Uh, a stronger mechanical system allows for greater fluid intake and uh, greater variability in speed. Now that we have a working prototype that we're happy with, we're building a network of these to deploy throughout Cambridge, about 10 of them. Um, they'll be controlled via a central decision maker, relaying data back to the cloud. So beginning to create a system feedback loop. Um, we're onboarding environmental sensors at the moment and soon be moving to onboarding targeted uh, sensors to target pathogens of interest. And uh, we're scheduled to test these out within the next month. 
So just quickly, um, we're still figuring out how to visualize and present the results of our experiment, um, but I'll share this uh, preliminary um, visualization that we've made. And if anything, it just begins to show the wealth and amount of information that, that is in just one sewage sample. So this is from one time point. And although here we're looking at data from one location at one time, you can begin to see this opportunity that we have to build rich databases that analyze fluctuations in urban health parameters over time and over space. And I'm gonna end with um, a, a quick fact that we, that we um, uh, pulled out, is that where typical wastewater treatment plant samples contain about one to 15% of bacterial families that are derived from humans, the sampling we did yielded about 50 to 70 percent um, bacterial families derived from humans. So this, uh, through this, we're really confident that our in-stream sampling design is efficient, effective, and really has the potential to transform urban health. Thank you. Thank you.